Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rash's World. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Andre Weisman. Hello. How are you doing? Fine. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for being on Rash's World. How would you briefly describe yourself in a few sentences? What would you say? How would you describe yourself? Oh, I describe myself that, that like somebody that sees a very simple answer to a, to a, a humanity problem. And I feel really weird because, you know, all I'm doing is modern medicine in a field that there's no medicine at all. So, and today I'm fighting against industries that they run budgets of millions and billions and billions on opiate dependency and nothing's getting better. Things just are getting worse and all the resources are being channeled to, to nonsense due to moral prejudices and greed. And when the answer is just on my face and sometimes, you know, to be the, considered the number one physician in a certain field. And I know that all I'm doing is just modern medicine, nothing really special, but become so special because others are kind of blind. So it's a very awkward position, to be honest with you, and a big responsibility I have on my shoulders. That's that's a wonderful introduction. Very, very uh, well said. And and I, I, I completely agree with that. There's uh, often like uh, I find with myself, I've discovered many things. Uh, my realm is more in, in, in psychology. And so but it's really hard to to get others to accept it. So one of the main things I look at is the holistic view of, of anything, including addiction or any any kind of issues one has to see the big picture instead of just focusing on one symptom or uh, trying to address that and taking that into consideration and I find it it's it's hard to get through often because people are just specialized in one tiny part and they don't see the the rest of the uh, of the picture no I, I think it's, it's a little bit in my field is a little bit more clear because in the 60s when opioid dependency became became a social event Mm -hmm. in Central Europe and in America, uh, in medicine, we did not have the capability, the technology to, to totally understand opioid receptors. Right. So the problem grew, every year became worse. So more funds were invested and channeled to the problem. So once you are invested, you become committed. And today becomes such a huge issue, uh, what is called addiction medicine, mm -hmm. that nobody's looking to very basic biology. Yeah, yeah, You know, I win after 15 years in the Israeli Supreme Court. Three weeks ago, a point that I made is written in opiates that you give painkillers that this substance might cause addiction. Yes. And yes. I say, I don't know what is addiction scientifically. It's a very vague word. So mm -hmm. this substance causes dependency. So finally, after 15 years of struggle, I succeed to have the Israeli uh, Supreme Court to erase the word addiction and to put instead the word dependency, which is a biological event. Makes sense. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so you, you're an opiate addiction specialist, you're an ICU physician, and uh, you have yep. uh, a treatment called ANR, Accelerated Neuroregulation, and that involves here also the brain, neuroscience, and so on. Can we talk about that? Because it sounds fascinating. Yes, I think the name of the treatment classify what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, a patient with opiate dependency, they don't need detoxification. Mm -hmm. and, and even patients that succeed with all kinds of treatments to overcome the withdrawals, most will relapse. Yeah, that's no. exactly that's exactly no, it. No, not but not because they have a mental problem. Uh, okay. Not because they are certain kind of people. No, they are mm -hmm. not. They become mm -hmm. once they have a basic problem not properly treated. Because what happened is that what is opiate dependency? Let's first of all clarify mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. Once you expose your brain to an external opiate, because you know we have our endorphin system. So we produce our natural opiates. Now, once you, you expose your brain or because of pain or for recreation or for curiosity or for whatever reason, doesn't matter. But once you expose your brain to opiates, you create a biological event. Mm -hmm. And once you do that again and again and again, this event will become an illness. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And what is the illness? 
is when you compromise the functionality of the endorphin system. Mm-hmm. Now, endorphins, why we produce endorphins? Endorphins are our natural antidepressant, anti-anxiety, painkiller. Mm-hmm. They, they are in charge of fluid regulation, thermal regulation, sleeping patterns, allow us to feel joy. So once the system is compromised, mm-hmm. all of those functions go totally out of track, which is the withdrawal syndrome. Mm-hmm. And then people have no other choice but to hunt for self-healing by using mm-hmm. external opiates to avoid the withdrawals. Yes. And then they are defined like addictive people with addictive personality. So they are defined and they have to learn how to become somebody else. Mm-hmm. And I have to be honest with you. I treat Nobel Prize winner. I treat mm-hmm. doctors, uh, politicians, uh, prime minister. I treat people from all walks of life mm-hmm. and they all had the same illness mm-hmm. in America. Every 15 minutes, you have a newborn with opiate dependency coming. Mm-hmm. Now, what, what they do to these newborn, the newborns, I tell you, they give them morphine. And then they try to oh win God. them off. 40% mm-hmm. will become will have brain damage because of that. Mm-hmm. I could reverse that in 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not me. Modern medicine. Mm-hmm. So there's so much ignorance in this field that the day patients would understand that they had the biological event and that situation should not define who they are. And they could go to a local hospital and having few hours, that condition reversed. People would not go to crimes and prostitution and all the the nightmare that they go through, you know, because they, they go because they have no hope and they would not need to lie. So I can teach people how to recognize when somebody from the family has opiate dependency. But if the treatment, what I do, would be widely available, so nobody needs to recognize because the guy is not having fun anymore. Mm -hmm. They have fun because opiates makes you feel great until you develop a dependency and then becomes a nightmare. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I I think part yes, it's definitely ignorance and there's also lots of lack of information or not good information that people have access to. But I'm wondering if uh, the science shows this and what you're saying is proven by science. So whether, and you mentioned earlier uh, greed, so whether that is kind of an overriding factor that people are are not addressing uh, these issues as they should because it, it fills their pockets. Again, talking about big corporations perhaps. It's not just big corporations, it's, it's worse than that. Do you know, America is a leading country like Israel too, but America mainly in science in the world. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. As, a, as a journalist, if somebody will check the budgets, governmental budgets that Johns Hopkins received to mm-hmm. make research on mm-hmm. the opioid crisis or the opiate dependency, all those years, how many publications came out of there? It's not be much. Amazed. Right? No, 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 it's a lot. Oh, it's a lot, okay. It's a lot. Yeah. And, and 50 years creating new professors, publishing a lot of pieces, mm-hmm. zero benefit for the patients. Oh, How okay. come? How come? Because they created 50 years ago what is called addiction medicine. And imagine a, a, you know, a rail track. One part will never meet the other. They are aside. Mm-hmm. So you have addiction medicine, and in addiction medicine, you have theories and no science. Mm-hmm. Because in, me- in medicine, who is agonizing and antagonizing opioid receptors? Who are playing with those receptors? I tell you, anesthesiologists, yeah. critical care physicians, not psychiatrists. Mm-hmm. But what happened is that people try to cope with the behavior of patients, not with the root of the biological problem they have. Because who should be treating those patients are people like me. I'm a critical care physician. So I know how to give opiates to a patient. And I know how to wash opiates out of the receptors. Because that's what they do every day. So for me, it's just naturally that somebody with my background in anesthesia would be the one to find a way to reverse this dependency totally. Mm -hmm. So you understand? But today, it's like you break your knee and you start shouting. What do you need, a psychiatrist or an orthopedic? <laughs> but because you are shouting, they bring you a psychiatrist. Of course, you're going to walk funny for the rest of your life. <laughs> and that's what happened. This is, con- is, is, is perceived and is considered a chronic relapsing condition. No, it is not. 
It's not chronic. It becomes chronic because the root of the problem was never properly treated. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I completely agree with that. Hundred percent. The root was not was not treated, and I think like the our our relationship with medicine and medication and so and and legal drugs, it's pretty relaxed, and it it shouldn't be. We, it's like it's kind of like giving away candy, where we have children who are quickly medicated or antidepressants, and and I think for from my point of view, I think we have to be more cautious with that, as you're saying, the effects that these drugs can have. Sometimes it's necessary, but to be able to to look at what can can cause that, what uh, can be caused in the in the patient, and a lot of people, I, I it reminds me strangely enough from uh, the movie French Connection too. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the, uh, yes, the I... detective is injected with drugs and he has no issues. He has no addictive personality, but because of the constant exposure, he becomes addicted to it. And I think that that is something that we have to fully understand that it's 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 the, the craving that it creates and then the continuous cycle. But so, uh, yeah. you, you spoke about two things, you know, yeah, I, know, I, know. About, I know, but if, mm -hmm. we, if we talk about the open dependency issue is an issue by itself and, and I pretty much work in this field for 35 years so I know I know the problems but you mm -hmm. said something else about general medicine mm -hmm. you know our problem is that mm -hmm. first of all we are not humble enough and we don't have enough gratitude because it doesn't matter if you believe in biology or you believe in God either way we have within us a self-healing system that is much more intelligent than any physician. So I always say to patients, for physicians, you can take your hat, don't take your head off. Mm -hmm. Because the industry of medicine, they want to treat everybody. They don't want to heal anybody, yeah. Yeah. but they want yeah. to treat everybody. There's a difference. Yes. When I studied yeah. medicine, to heal and to treat was the two sides of the coin. Nobody wants to heal. You see diabetes. Mm -hmm. How come all those years? There's no answer for that. Exactly. Because it's the most profitable industry possible. Yes. So when you go to a hospital, the priorities are the liability, they're afraid of lawsuits. Mm -hmm. And sure. second, the bill, how to create from each patient a very large bill, then the status of the people working, the patient comes four or fifth. Now the patients by themselves, they, they are educated to take medication for everything. So they are educated, I can <laughs> eat bad, I can treat my mind bad. I live with no movement. I don't stimulate my intellect. And then I have a problem. I go to the doctor and I take a tablet. So what I'm trying to say, uh, humanity is paying a very high price for the modern medicine or for the industry of medicine. Mm -hmm. And people should take some responsibility yes. and to protect their vessel in a better way. And then you go to medicine when you have no choice, when you have a lot to gain, very little to lose. Absolutely, absolutely, 100%. I, I was suffering from high blood pressure and uh, um, I found a way of dealing with it with naturally self-healing as, as you're saying, by uh, changing a lot of, it was st stress often, toxic stress that I had to deal with. And once it was gone, I was fine. And I did not need the medication that my physician was trying to impose upon me. And I think that's important of trying it out and see if it works. Now, what you're mentioning reminds me of, of cancer and cancer research, um, because I, I've seen a lot of uh, investment goes into treatment, but it's minimal of researching it, of finding here the cause of how to, uh, how to deal with that. Another thing just to add to that would also be prevention of making sure we don't get to that point. We don't get to those to that issue. So I think that fully applies to to the opiate epidemic as well. Once we can really start, you're talking about the baby who's already addicted from a newborn. This is horrible. This is terrifying. And so once we start off well and we can prevent it, then we don't even have to deal with with all the other issues that come after. Do you know, you talk about research, let me tell you something. Research became such a huge industry that is one of our enemies because people are forgetting all the basics. If, yeah. if, if we put, instead of billions of dollars, zero on research for the next five years, but doctors will go to basic medicine, to basic knowledge, mm -hmm. nutrition, prevention, mm -hmm. you know, optimizing what you can, not giving medication because we don't have a, patient to wait a little bit. I mean, if we change the whole concept, you're going to have less people needing uh, medical assistance. Mm 
<laughs> then doing more and more research. There's very few issues in medicine with more research than, than, than drug addiction. You have thousands of professors in America because they became professors because they published a lot of things. Now ask me their names, I tell you, I don't know. Why? Because they never brought something to me that would help me to treat better my next patient. It's all blah, 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 all theories and a lot of words and a lot of money and a lot of status. So that's the enemy right yes, now. Yes. Opioid dependency is a reversible medical condition. But once you don't reverse in 20 years, of course, the side effects will become behavior on the psychology of the patient. You know, today I treat a girl that she became a prostitute because she had to find some way to bring money. And she could not steal money. She didn't have the physical strength. So all she could do is to sell her body. Now, I come to my treatment to her 20 years down the line. No self-respect, no self-esteem. I mean, she looks all darkness. So the, so the damages of the untreated, untreated illness will be very hard to take care of. But if every opioid dependency patient will know if they can go to a local hospital and have their dependency, including cravings, because cravings for opiate is a psychological manifestation of a biological problem, treatable. <laughs> So once you take the withdrawals away, you take the cravings away and you give back the endorphins so they can feel joy, they don't feel cravings. You know, and most people I met in my life, they would rather be healthy than ill. <laughs> so there's no crisis, no problem. I was at the, at, the, at the Senate in America and I spoke with the senators, maybe, I don't know, 50 of them. And I said, guys, there's no epidemic. Let me teach 10 anesthesiologists. Let each one teach another 10. And let's hit each one another 10. And in one year, you have no opioid crisis without investing one dollar. <laughs> it's basic knowledge <laughs> that are in textbooks of medicine. But opioid dependent patients are classified, are denied to receive proper medical care. And that's the problem, which is common knowledge in textbooks of medicine. No research needed. No research. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I, I think I think that again the the question really for me that that really like resonates with me is is why why is this why is this why has it increased over the ten years uh, where we've had half a million deaths uh, according to estimates that I've seen so what 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 is what is really driving it so you've given part of the answer is uh, um, the way um, we deal with with medication and drugs and uh, again uh, in, you know, in the medical field but when more people become dependent mm -hmm. and less percentage become healed mm -hmm. because it's a very small percentage, of course it will grow like that mm -hmm. and it will become worse and worse and worse. And you have every year more people dependent mm -hmm. from a, a younger age. So it becomes a national uh, catastrophe mm -hmm. and it is. It is, yeah. The, the problem is it's under our nose and politi politicians always they talk about this before elections or immediately after elections, and then the issue will disappear again. Yeah, yeah you yeah. know, you go go on YouTube, see uh, Junkies Lament, Johnny Cash, mm -hmm. 1969. He talks about the opioid epidemic. Oh, okay. 1969, Johnny Cash write this song and talk about the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. So it's not something new. It's mm -hmm. just getting worse and worse and worse. You have almost like a jumbo plane falling every day. And the answers are there, allowed human beings to have proper medical care. Don't yeah. judge them, don't moral confront them, yeah. just reverse their illness. But they create such a huge structure. Do you know how many rehab centers you have in America? <laughs> Do you know how many detox centers and how many whatever? Do you know that insurance companies are paying them 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars? You know, wh why they want to change, why they want to listen to me? They want me to die tomorrow. Because what I say is that not that I'm special, I'm not. My IQ probably is average. You know, I'm just using modern medicine in a field that there's no medicine at all. So I say, if I can do, any good anesthesiologist can do it too. And I'm willing to teach for free. That's it. Wonderful. Do you understand? You, yeah, and you you have a lot of uh, clinics around the world uh, um, that are showing results. 
I, uh, so results should matter. I think we should always go, even if the science might not be able to explain something, in my case, no, no, how no, did no, I no, just, just the results no, no. do matter? Not, it, no, 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 it's more than that. Mm -hmm. I make a point out yeah. of, in Switzerland, in yeah. Israel, yeah. in everywhere I work, yeah. I work always with the chairman, with the chief of anesthesia of a large hospital. Yeah. So who is working with me in America, He's the chief and the chairman of the anesthesia department of the second largest hospital in Tampa. Mm -hmm. So understand, I work with anesthesiologists that they are recognized to be the top of their, of their whatever. Mm -hmm. And they do open heart surgery. So if they are doing my treatment, that's it. So everything <laughs> I do can be explained in medicine. <laughs> you know, in the, listen, in the year 2000, mm -hmm. 22 years ago, Texas Tech University gave me an honor as a professorship and I lecture for more than 50 anesthesiologists. This was 22 years ago. So what I'm trying to say, my treatment is totally scientifically mm -hmm. proved. There's no question about mm -hmm. it. Otherwise, mm -hmm. directors of hospital, chief of anesthesia, the Israeli minister of health, you know, I told to the senators, you know, it's funny because America and Israel, we are brother in arms. So you cannot find one airplane, warplane, without Israeli technology mm -hmm. in your army. Mm -hmm. So we share information. How come our vets in Israel are being healed from opioid dependency for almost 30 years like that? Mm -hmm. And how come your veterans are walking like zombies and dying and suiciding every day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I offer the VA, I teach for free. Let me introduce the, the procedure in one VA hospital. Let this hospital be a reference point for others and you teach them all. Mm -hmm. so, so there's so much involved because you ask, how come if you are doing and it's proved not everybody's doing? Because I'm sorry, because all the dozens of thousands of professors and physicians work in this field, you know, they are having a great time. I'm honest with you. Mm -hmm. We are human beings can be very cynical. Mm -hmm. So I'm rocking the boat of everybody. And more than that, I'm taking this field out of the hands of uh, psychiatrists and psychologists to the hand of anesthesiologists. Mm -hmm. The psychiatrists, they don't want to lose the market. Mm -hmm. this, the anesthesiologists, they don't understand yet that this is their market. So the, the, this is a problem too. So it's, it's very difficult. What you're doing right now, mm -hmm. if you believe in God, you are blessed. Ask why? Because I can do whatever I'm doing. But if the people will not know, and they try to block me everywhere, all the clinics, they try to block me in the internet to write whatever, is a war out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to, to not to rock the boat. Yeah, but uh, I, I'm thinking, is it because it's of tradition? You say, we've always done it this way and we continue. A kind of like narrow-minded way of like, this is how we've always done it and we're going to continue with that in no, those no, perhaps no, research no, centers. No. no? If, if we open the door, <clears throat> so general hospitals will do three A and R, mm -hmm. accelerated neural regulation, mm -hmm. like they do appendectomy mm -hmm. or any other standard medical treatment, all this market will disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know this administration, the previous administration of Donald Trump, they add in one year, $32 billion to this field. Mm -hmm. That's what they add. Mm -hmm. So all this money will disappear. Because there's no need. Yeah. Is it, yeah. Listen, listen, is one day of hospitalization. And this is a patient that's dependent for 20 years. If I treat somebody that's dependent for two years, we will not be even, even 24 hours of hospitalization. So how much this will cost? $1,000, $800, $600. So you, you, this market disappears. And, and, and if you look at prevention, I mean, it's uh, like, it doesn't cost anything, but the, 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 the problem with that is it doesn't make headlines. So when you can, it's, it's much, when they can cure something, when they can make like a show, like we've treated this many people, then it, it makes headlines people talk about and politicians focus on that and doctors as well. But I think like, we should really also look at the basics of like, how can we prevent fr this from happening? But there is not enough information. There's not enough push. There's not Listen, enough incentive there. What I said was something very simple. What I mm -hmm. said is like, bring me your best 
mm-hmm. then if this is a, a national crisis mm-hmm. and people are dying in hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. in a short, mm-hmm. I mean, bring your 10 best anesthesiologists, mm-hmm. let them analyze everything I do mm-hmm. and let them advise you. And that's yes. it. Yes. If it's such a tragedy and this will cost no money, they need to be with me a week and yeah. that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Bring your 10 best. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. So it's such a tragedy that, and, and I tell you, you see all those zoos, for example, do you know that I'm the only physician in the world that claims, it's funny because if the lawyers of the big pharma will listen to me, they will be knocking on my door tomorrow. You know why? Mm. Because I claim that more patients are being hurt because doctors are afraid to give opiates then the patients hurt because they are taking too much opiates. Do you know that 99% of patients who are currently hospitalized, they could have great benefits from opiates, but doctors are not giving because they are afraid? Mm-hmm. Do you know if those doctors wouldn't be ignorant and they would know how to do what they do? If you have a, a car accident and you all broke it, the doctors can give you as much opiates as they want. After a month that you're going to be released from the hospital, they can make a test. Oh, he's open independent. They reverse it in one hour and you go home happy. Mm-hmm. Imagine how many people are suffering at the hospitals, burns and this and that and cancer. And doctors are afraid to give him opiates. Mm-hmm. Do you understand? Because they are ignorant. Mm-hmm. So you measure a good medication by the good effects against the side effects. <laughs> so the main side effects of opiates are the dependency. But if you can remove the dependency in one hour, in a very simple way. So what's the problem to give opiates to patients? So imagine how many people are suffering unnecessarily because doctors decided to be ignorant. And we put our trust in, into their hands. I mean, they, they are the ones who, who treat us. So it, we follow their advice and guidance. So it, it, it makes it even more tragic. And I'm thinking like, would regulation help so that doctors would be regulated by the government that they cannot do this or do that, or there's a limit. No, no, that. no, I, no, I doubted no, that. Yeah. No, no, the, it won't, the, 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 the most effective way to take care of this epidemic mm-hmm. is to heal mm-hmm. the sick, mm-hmm. to reverse the illness. By the way, you talk about prevention. Mm-hmm. You know what, what brings people into use? A viability. Mm-hmm. Now, people who sell fentanyl on the streets, mm-hmm. if you take a neighborhood, And from that neighborhood, you treat 100 people in one month, what will happen? Less people looking for it, less people buying. Mm -hmm. So the guy who sells, he look for a new new, uh, neighborhood. And in that neighborhood, less people will fall into this dependency. So so, uh, one doctor can do a work on prevention that a thousand policemen cannot do. Mm -hmm. I can take more drugs from the streets than any policeman because my patients, they don't buy anymore. So if you take the market away, less people will fall into that. So it doesn't matter as you put it. If somebody became dependent because he did something wrong, if you can heal him, you, you, you stop a whole chain of events yes. that leave us to this crisis. Yes, 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 absolutely. Uh, one of the things they talk about is also that the drugs are impure. So that's what's killing people and so on. How much truth is, is there in, 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 in this, uh, this statement? Like uh, say yeah, that. No, no. Uh, again, there, there's a lot of that, but yeah. I don't believe that people are being poisoned and they okay. are dying from right. impurity. Okay. Yes, the drugs are very impure, and sometimes the impurity is what to save their lives. Mm-hmm. Most of the people will die because of a very simple reason: you produce endorphins, mm-hmm. but you produce micrograms of endorphins a day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when you start using milligrams, the body starts producing new receptors. Mm-hmm. And then you have more receptors, what happened? You're gonna need a higher dosage to reach the same effect. (laughs) So you raise up your dosage. (laughs) By the way, once you need to raise up your dosage, you raise up the the level of criminality as well because you need more money. (laughs) And then you take a higher dosage and then you make more receptors. And then what happened? You take a higher dosage until you reach a day that the dosage you think you need is the dosage that will kill you. So most people die over dosage it comes from a point that they have so many receptors, they can take so much that one day they take, they think that what they need, what they think they need is what they what will kill them. Mm-hmm. And most will die during their sleep. 
And um, just to look at something, something else here with uh, my addiction to coffee, but I find that it can be regulated because I, I have, uh, again, a certain amount. I have two cups per day and that's it. And uh, But I do know that I do crave it. That's something I need to have every day. So I, I would consider that an addiction. But what is the difference in terms of the neuroscience too between this and uh, when we look at, uh, at other kinds of drugs, like illegal drugs? Well, I, I tell you, I tell you and, and by the way, I don't know you and I'm not mm -hmm. trying to be to honey, whatever you, mm -hmm. but you're a smart man because you're using the right words and yeah. terminology defines a lot of things. Yeah. So when you say the word of regulation, that's the key of every, what you guys call addiction. What is addiction? Ask a professor of psychiatrist. He's going to talk a lot. Mm -hmm. And he's going to say, oh, that's a resume, but it's more complicated. Mm -hmm. Addiction is neuro adaptation. Mm -hmm. Means whenever you introduce into your biological cycle a new element, the body has the capability to make some changes to adapt to the newcomer. Mm -hmm. Now, if the newcomer, like coffee, will cause you some constriction in some uh, vessels and some arteries and this will give you a certain feeling mm -hmm. you be your body adapt to that mm -hmm. so once you stop having coffee mm -hmm. you're going to have a headache yeah. because you're going to have dilatation of your you understand yeah. so you are regulated to live with that coffee and that coffee will cause chemical mm -hmm. events mm -hmm. now once you take the coffee away now you need to go through a period of new regulation mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I say what I do is accelerated neuroregulation. Because so you can become addicted to a picture in the wall, to the perfume of a woman, to two, two spoons of sugar in your coffee. You, we, we human, some insects will die. They don't adapt. Humans, they can adapt. Therefore, there's no addiction personalities. We all have addiction personalities. Yeah. We all adapt yes. to smells, to some people. To some, to whatever. Some people listen to, um, I don't want to say a bad thing about a singer, but it doesn't matter. To some singers that they don't understand and mm -hmm. they get, they get adapt because this is neuro stimulation. So the whole media, the whole marketing industry is creating stimulation in your brain, exposing you to all kinds of things. You adapt to those things. They become part of you. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I mean, that's it. You can be addicted to work, a workaholic, to, to shopping, shopaholic, and I think even to exercise. There are people who are like compulsively exercising, and I, I, I see that it's, it's, it's to get harmful. And maybe we can look at, yes, yeah, sorry. For everything we expose mm -hmm. ourselves, there is a chemical event going on. Mm -hmm. Whenever you are exposed to whatever, smell, sight, noise, a chemical response happens there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you expose yourself again and again and again, you get used to that response. It becomes a habit, yeah. Be no, it becomes part of you. Yeah. And yeah. for you to take this away because, oh, no, this is causing me harm, you must go through a new regulation again because you are regulated with that chemical event. That's all. That's the concept of addiction. It's not something that a certain kind of people they have. No. It's a human capability that is very well used by the marketing industry to push us to buy all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, would uh, neuro-linguistic programming work there, NLP, and uh, to, to help uh, along that path of like, again, changing your mindset? I know with behaviors, habits, if we do, I think 30 days is like the, the, the range we look at. If you can do it without, if you can stay away from coffee and from like doing it for 30 days, I'm going to be okay. And uh, can that kind of mindset also uh, additionally help with, with these issues? First of all, first of all, if you optimize mm -hmm. things you already have, mm -hmm. the feeling, your, your, your well-being will improve so much. Mm -hmm. that this period of transition will become much more easier. Yes, we can readapt to whatever, but understand, mm -hmm. most human beings are living with 65, 60% of their endorphin production capability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you change your routine mm -hmm. and you have more movement, yeah. right diet, yeah. Yeah. right nutrition, yeah. Yeah. and intellectual activities, you can go to 70% of production of endorphin, 80%. 110, 
if you exercise the concept of love mm -hmm. and gratitude, you know, sex bring endorphins up and down. Yeah. But the state of love, which is a totally different yeah. ball game, yeah. gives you a high plateau of endorphins. Those are the people walking the streets and smiling. They don't take antidepressants. They don't have headaches. Yeah. Yeah. Most likely they won't have heart attacks and they look good. It, these these are natural endorphins. highs, natural endorphins. I had migraines every week, and then I was able to to just reach a state of, of as you're saying, a gratitude, of happiness, of enjoyment of life. And I see there's no need for anything else. I do have my coffee because I like it. I, I drink a, a bottle of wine with my wife once per week, and that's it. There's no more craving for that. And it's something I look yes. forward to and I enjoy. So just like the, the Buddha would say, moderation is really the key if we can find a, that, that balance of doing things but, for but enjoyment. Again, but, 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 certain, nobody yeah. want, but we are, we are pre we are pre-programmed not to have mo moderation in anything. Yeah. It, it they want us to buy and to buy and to buy and to eat and to eat yeah. and to eat and to drink. And to, that's what everybody wants from us. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it is a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I drink coffee too. I mm -hmm. do other bad things, but there's a tight price. So but I try to balance. I try at huh. least to have gratitude and to have an attitude that I do feel love for all and yes. everything. Yes. And this keeps me alive, to be honest with you, yes. because you know I have a very stressful life. Mm -hmm. But but yeah. I think love is the key word. I don't want to sound like John Lennon, <laughs> but, key, but the chemistry uh, shows that the state of love and gratitude brings you a plateau of high endorphins, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. which is antidepressant, anti-anxiety, allows you to sleep well and to feel joy. For me, it's spirituality and not necessarily following a specific religion, but that kind of connection, interconnection and uh, with others and with oneself and so on. I think that's hugely important. And that's for me, that's what I'm looking in terms of prevention, too. So there's no need for uh, refuge, for escape or anything or trying to to divert your energy in different directions. And I know uh, with opiate addiction is different, right? But, but, but I tell you why I tell you why it's different. Yeah. You know, uh, we can talk a little bit openly in this. Yeah, podcast. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. As as open okay. as you like. Okay. Do you do you ever had sex in your life? Did I? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Did you yeah, come? Did you yeah. do, do, did yeah. you come in your life? How do you feel immediately after you come? I tell you how you feel. You feel mm -hmm. high. Yeah. You yeah. Feel, absolutely. Uh, wow. Yeah. What is that feeling? Yeah. That feeling is a shot of endorphins. Why? Because yeah. when, before you come, your blood pressure is high, your pulse is high, you are all <laughs> excited. And then the body to re-regulate itself, to come down, uh -huh. when, you, when you come and yes. your yeah. brain receives shots of yeah. endorphins. So with opiates, it's a problem. Because when you try an opiate, you know how you feel? Fantastic. Okay. So yeah. it's just natural that you're going to take it again. Mm -hmm. Especially if you don't fit the profile of a junkie, oh, mm -hmm. I'm a nice person, I like sports, <laughs> I this, I, I, I don't have an addictive personality. Okay, so we it. lie to the people, yeah. so people are not afraid to experiment. Why? Because I don't fit the profile of a junkie. Mm -hmm. So I'll be okay. And to be honest, yes, they take opiates and they're not dependent yet. So they take again and they're not dependent yet. And they take again. Some people can take for three months, some people for six months, and suddenly they wake up in the morning and the endorphin system is gone. <laughs> and they have nausea, <laughs> diarrhea, and vomiting. And then instead of reversing that medical condition, society, the rehab centers will tell you who you are. <laughs> you have an addictive personality. You know, you're going to be addicted for the rest of your life. Relapse is part of your recovery. You know, they tell you all kinds of, of ignorant things that defines who you are. And then the end, you believe in what they say. And you pay them yeah. a lot of money to tell all oh, this, I'm sorry, crap. Yeah, we're, we're deluding ourselves. In many ways, we're yeah. deluding ourselves. And I, I think what it would really help if people open up about it. And you, you're saying that very intelligent people, that uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners, that uh, uh, politicians they should come out and talk about it and say, look, this affected me. This is happening to me and this could happen to you. So others could, could uh, refrain from falling into that trap. 
I, I, I understand what you say. Yeah. But the problem is not falling into the trap. Yeah. I, I, I suggest to every human being, don't play with your brain. Because yeah, we exactly. doctors, we don't, we don't know enough about the brain. You know, there's a substance that plays with your heart mm -hmm. and it stops your heart for 10 seconds and you feel great. Mm -hmm. It's fine with me. But don't play with your brain. Mm -hmm. And you can have all kinds of different highs depending how you stimulate. I have a lot to say about that. Mm -hmm. But if people play with their brain and they get an accident, mm -hmm. let's free them immediately. So the secondary effects of the untreated primary illness will not destroy the life of this person, of his neighborhood, and of the city, and of the country. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. We cannot, we cannot solve all the problems of the world, but we have to have the remedies. Like people can have road, a car accident. So I say, you know, drive carefully. But if you have an accident, I'm going to treat you. I'm not, not going to judge you. Oh, why did you uh, drive fast? Now is your problem. You're going to bleed <laughs> yeah. to death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, yeah, yeah. We don't act like that. Yeah. No, and that, that, that's not the job of a doctor. I mean, the doctor of has course, to save lives. Though, yeah. No, no. But in addiction, it is the job of the doctor because even in the centers that the insurance companies are paying, you have to prove that you have motivation. Otherwise, they will not accept you. So there's all kinds of things. I see some movie stars, you know, people like to talk mm -hmm. about movie stars, that they go to, to trial for, for using opiates for the whatever. And then the judge give them, uh, you know, okay, you're not going to go in, but if you relapse, you go to treatment. If you relapse, you're going to go in. And I tell the judge, listen, you're making a mistake because his relapse is due to an untreated illness. <laughs> and, the, and, and the cravings are at the receptor level. So you cannot uh, put in prison a guy that did not comply with your request because he's ill, because he has diabetes or because his receptors are asking for it. So First of all, society should allow this person to be properly healed. Is the medicine is out there, if this is possible. And afterwards, you confront him. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So, yeah, as I, it, it's like as you're I, sending them to their doom, then you're not like really like helping them at the moment. And they're, they're gonna most likely relapse. So why not treat it right there? Before no, and, and, you, again. and you can you giving them an impossible task. Because exactly. If you have, okay. Yeah, if yeah. you have 12 stomachs, I cannot tell you, or you lose weight, or you're going to jail. Uh -huh. but, but judge, I have 12 stomachs. What do you want from me? Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. So once you have all those extra receptors crying and craving for it, mm -hmm. what do you want from the guy? You know, a, a, a clean drug addict, they make a thousand good decisions. And they make one bad decision, they are gone. Yeah. So how strong you can be? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, let's look at three, uh, three ways. You talk about three ways of spotting opiate uh, dependency uh, in, in people. So wh what are they? So, so people can be more aware of it and, and recognize it in time. What would you okay, say? so you want, once you understand that uh, endorphins have to do with fluid regulation, thermal regulation, pain regulation, sleeping patterns, and everything I said, and feeling joy, and everything I said about the endorphin system, mm -hmm. once the endorphin system starts being compromised, you're going to see alterations, mm -hmm. uh, changes in all those aspects. So we're going to have a guy that will have once in a while or constipation or diarrhea that suddenly you see constipation or diarrhea. Suddenly he goes to the toilet and he stays there for half an hour because he cannot put the poo out. Or you have him with extreme diarrhea. Mm -hmm. So you can have him with like flu-like symptoms. Because mm -hmm. what I said, general pain, nose running because of mm -hmm. fluid regulation, those are symptoms of a flu. Mm -hmm. So when you see somebody having flus again and again and again, and worse than that, the flus disappear suddenly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he has a, a strong flu, and three hours after, he's fine. And then after five days, he has a flu again. Oh, what I is the flu? Huh. I never what knew that, flu? yeah. Yeah. He, does, he doesn't have enough stuff right now. Yeah. And then in three hours, somebody brings him and the flu disappears. But then five days afterwards, he's, uh, he didn't have the money or whatever happened. And he has the same flu again. The nose is running. Uh -huh. So when you see alterations and all the systems to do with pain, with alertness, because suddenly, you know, I said the sleeping pattern, suddenly you see the guy watching a TV and suddenly he, he, he nods, he falls asleep. And then he wakes up again. This is a sign. 
So as I said, everything to do with depression, anxiety, fluids, temperature, sleeping during the day, at night. So all those changes, and the changes are not in one direction because it's always according to the level of opiates they have in their brain. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see changes to one extreme and changes to the opposite extreme. Mm -hmm. Or he's super alert with a lot of anxiety that is not quiet mm -hmm. because he's missing the drug or he is nodding and falling asleep mm -hmm. because he's full of it. So those are, those are, are the, the things you should be aware of. Understanding that the signs are like flu-like signs, that's what you have to look for. Mm -hmm. and, and changes of behavior and frustration. And, and he's super calm, almost uh, totally apathic, totally, he doesn't care what's going on, or he's hyper alert mm -hmm. because he, he's not well. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it's, it's quite simple. Mm -hmm. But again, if those patients will know that this could be easily reversed, they will not hide. Why they hide? Mm -hmm. Because they don't expect any help. It takes them a long while to be convinced that they are different and they have this addiction problem that is like a curse for the rest of their lives. So it takes you a while to accept that. And in this while, you, you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the dependency mm -hmm. and then it's too late. And, and, and the body is amazing at alerting you, like of telling you there's something wrong. And we just have to really listen to that. But often it's right. also ignored and people take more pills to, to calm the, that. And it just creates, again, more of a vicious cycle, we'd say. Listen, once there's so much ignorance, I watch the movies. The guy who writes the script, they're so yes. ignorant about yes. addiction that any movie you see, I, I try to close my eyes. I get angry because they are giving the wrong information to people. That's not what happens. And that's oh, not the problem. I'd be curious. What would be a good movie you'd, you'd recommend that gives a, a more like accurate no, portrayal? I'm sorry. No? I'm sorry. I cannot. Okay. Yet to be written. Yet to okay. be made. Okay. They are all, they, they give all the wrong information. Oh. You, you, you understand? It's, there's so much moral prejudice, so much ignorance in this field that if you're writing a script for a movie, you talk with who are you going to talk to have information? With experts in addiction. Yeah, I tell you more than that. Imagine a judge that file a huge pharmaceutical company, $700 million. Now go and see who were the experts mm -hmm. that based on the experts, the judge make this decision of $700 million. I tell you were the experts, totally ignorant people on the issues they are expert of. Mm -hmm. And scientifically, I can prove that. Mm -hmm. So do you understand the consequences that judges are, are not well informed? The whole legal system, you know, yes. A I lot of the information to... comes from the media and movies. So that's, that's where, for many of us, that's where we learn about but the world. But... Judges are a main critical, you know, I tell you more than that, uh -huh. children. Do you know the children with cancer? Probably 70% of the cancers are curable. Yes. And many of those children in the pain management, they become opiate dependent mm -hmm. and nobody's trying to heal them. They give them methadone and they go like brain lobotomy. They go to school under the effects of methadone and that's it. Their life is done. 12 years old, go like a zombie to school. Will take me an hour and a half to reverse that. Not me, any good anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. Isn't it a crime? Mm -hmm. it, is, so, it is. So instead of suing the pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. I would put against the wall Harvard, Yale, Johns Hopkins. Where you guys been? Why you guys are not using modern medicine to treat such a, a huge problem that, he, uh, that affects newborns, children, people from all ages and all walks of life for so, so many years? How come is the only field of medicine with zero development? or improvement in the last 60 years. How come? Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's frustrating. Do you understand it's frustrating my frustration? The, it's, it's a simple solution. As you said at the very beginning, the simple solution and again, cost effective and all that, but people are, are just not, not following it, not recognizing it, not uh, acting upon it in many ways. You know, the, the, the simple solution is a very old concept of thousands mm -hmm. of years that if you see a human being ill, you try to help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's the, the basic concept of medicine. Mm -hmm. 
So when you exclude a certain kind of people from this right to receive proper medical care, this is, a, in my opinion, a crime against humanity. It is. Now, Dr. Weissman, who is committing the crime? The academics, the professors, because if you receive millions and millions and millions of budget to research open independence in the last 30 years, and you are a very famous professor of addiction, but you brought zero improvement to the field, come and explain to me what you did with the people's money. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Because the same treatments they are offering today, they were offering 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Methadone was developed by Adolf Hitler to make the Holocaust mm -hmm. more effective. You know, and it's being marketed like today by the, all yes. the governments. Yes. You know, in the, in the end of the 60s, uh, Jack Nicholson uh, showed the world what is lobotomy. Yeah. yeah. Because you're using lobotomy against uh, people because they are angry, because they do, do crimes. Mm -hmm. And then it was a big discussion and they stopped doing lobotomy. Yeah. So methadone yeah. is chemical lobotomy. It's mm -hmm. chemical lobotomy. You're dragging people to death. That's what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and it's considered a treatment. Yeah. Oh, it's the yeah. most popular treatment in America. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Which is a crime. Yeah. I, I'm just curious here to, to wrap up is what drove you in this direction of, of research? You're very passionate about it and very knowledgeable and it's just wonderful your, your initiatives here. But what, uh, what drove you in this direction of, of really studying it, researching it and, uh, and, and trying to help people with, with addiction? Three things, uh, a newborn, mm -hmm. when, I, when I was training for intensive care, for critical care, and I was in a neonatal department, and I saw a, a newborn from an addict mother, and uh, I said, okay, what do we do? No, we give those drops methadone, and he'll oh, be yeah. calm. And I okay. say, why cannot we just reverse that instead of making more addicted and then try to win him up? This was one second. I was at the military. I was in the, it's like an Israeli, infantry, you know, mm -hmm. parachutes. Mm -hmm. And I had two soldiers that one lost a leg in Lebanon and was one, one was steroidly burned, both became dependent. Mm -hmm. And people tried to convince me two years after, this was trauma from the war. No, 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 no. no. At the hospital, they no. received morphine, morphine, yeah. morphine, anyway. Yeah. And, then, and then what I, my common knowledge of drug addiction, and one day I said, what's the difference between a newborn, a war hero, and a criminal in the streets using drugs. It's the same illness. Yeah. And then I opened simple books of medicine, textbooks, and the answers were there. I had no education on drug addiction. This was 32 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for answers, and then I put a protocol together. I went to the Israeli chief of the College of Anesthesiologists. I said, listen, that's what I believe we can do. Do you want to do something together with me and to put this forward? And that's the way it started. Yeah. And then the, the, the rest is history because, you know, I had already several heart attacks. I'm not getting healthier. Uh, and I, my passion comes from a very simple reason. I suffer from a mental illness that I'm in love with my wife and every day more and more and more. And uh, I have six kids, three grandchildren, and 90, 90% of my time, I am far from them. So I have to make my breathing worthy. Mm -hmm. So my, my job in life is not to treat another thousand, but to teach a thousand doctors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's to pass it. it on, to pass it on. And I'm running against time. So I go everywhere in the world and I'm willing to collaborate. No business, no money. I'm not a rich person, believe me or not, after treating 24,000 people. And I don't, I don't believe in numbers. Mm -hmm. For your family, your loved one is your 100%. Yeah. And I know that. And I never forget that. So the treatment as well has to be individualized by the physical needs of that patient. So we can talk a lot. And I know that you don't have the time. So th that's my deal. My deal is to teach and to spread the word mm -hmm. and to do what I'm doing. And what I'm going to start doing now that I didn't do until now is to start appearing in courts. Mm -hmm. I opened a new corporation that all I'm going to do is to give scientific, uh, how you say, uh, uh, expert opinion to the courts, because mm -hmm. I want to challenge everything that's been said in the courts scientifically. Yes. And this will change, because in the medical world, I did a quite good bit, 
Now I believe I should bring this knowledge to the courts as well, because the change will come from the combination. Judges should know better, and judges should put the academics against the wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You understand? Yeah, yeah. For for their uh, responsibility of you know yes. being involved in this. Uh, of course. So so uh, people can find out more, the audience can find out more about you. You have a website, anrclinic.com. Um, they can uh, also, you have a blog, which is quite informative about talking about the different uh, medication and drugs and the effects they have and so on. And again, so for knowledge, uh, would you, I would definitely recommend them to visit your website. Is there anything else you'd like to uh, share how they can contact you or, or Listen. find out more? You said my name many times. I, I'm a very good guy on marketing and on promotion and whatever. Mm -hmm. That's not my goal. Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe in God. May God bless you because without guys like you, the word would not be out. Mm -hmm. So that's it. So you're doing your bit. I'll keep doing my bit. And let's hope that uh, we're going to care more for each other, have more gratitude for what we have so we can spend more energy doing for others. You know, the sun doesn't keep the heat for himself. The rivers doesn't keep the water from, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. nature is based in a way that what you have, you give, and then you move on. Otherwise, you get stuck. That's Thank what I so believe. Much. Thank you so much. Such an honor, such a pleasure talking to you, uh, Dr. Andrew Weisman, uh, opiate addiction specialist and ICU physician and passionate about life. Uh, thank you yeah. so much for being on Rash as well. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me.